everybody. Sorry for the slight technical delay there, but my name is Henrietta Billings and I'm the director of Save Britain's Heritage. And I'm delighted to invite you all to this special event on the battle to save Grimsby's historic docks and what happened next. I'm joined here virtually by John Darlington, the director of World Monuments Fund Britain, and also by Vicky Hartung, chair of the, Grims the Grimsby based Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust. We're so pleased to see so many people here from joining us from different parts of the world. I think we've got people here from Australia, the United States, Malaysia, Finland, Edinburgh, Grimsby, of course, and even London. This event is being recorded. So if you do have technical difficulties, like we have experienced slightly, um, it will be available for viewing afterwards at your pleasure. We're also really glad to be able to host these events at a time when normal face-to-face -face events aren't possible for us um, and of course they are a really important revenue stream so thank you so much indeed for your donations towards the work of World Monuments Fund and Save Britain's Heritage because our work simply isn't possible without your support. So the lineup for today's event is that I will give you an introduction to Save Britain's Heritage and how we work and a lead up to the um, 2016 campaign for the dock buildings. Then we'll have an overview from John Darlington over the World Monument Fund's involvement in Grimsby and particularly their interest in the ice factory. And then we'll be joined by Vicky, who will give us um, an update on where we've got to since 2016 and all the developments that are taking place in the um, in the Casbah, including regeneration initiatives which are taking shape. Then we'll go to the questions and comments and so I would really encourage you to keep um, posting your comments and questions in the box um, to the right hand side of your screens. Now I'm going to share the presentation. first hurdle, technical hurdle, complete. So Save Britain's Heritage, who are we and what do we do? For those of you who aren't familiar with um, our organisation, we're a charity. We are. We were set up in 1975 as a um, champ champion organisation, really, to defend historic buildings under threat from demolition or um, uh, imminent um, neglect or decay. And we were set up in 1975, which was the uh, year of the destruction of the Country House exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this was a really seminal exhibition, really, that um, drew people's attention to the plight of a lot of very important, grand um, historic country houses that had been demolished um, over the first half of the 20th century. And it was a um, really important exhibition that threw the spotlight, really, on these really extraordinary heritage assets that were being demolished. And it's interesting because people, although this obviously happened quite some time ago, but people still talk to me today about the impact that that exhibition had on them and that really their relationship with conservation and um, and say Britain's Heritage, which hosted that um, exhibition. So in terms of the team, we're a small team, um, some part time, some full time, uh, six of us based in Farringdon in the city of London. We have a very active social media feed. Um, Twitter and Facebook. And um, we also work collaboratively wherever we can with national and local organisations like World Monuments Fund and the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust. And what makes us different from other organisations is that we actively collaborate to um, with architects and um, investors and developers to try to find alternative uses for these buildings that are under threat. We don't just say, no, don't touch it. We say, let's think about different ways we can bring about new life for these buildings and that's a very important way that um, uh, we work and I'm very proud of the work we do and this one for example shows four little houses right next door to the courthold and the um, Somerset House on the Strand in central London and this was a key campaign for us which was successful in stopping the demolition of these four terraced houses um, and um, coming up with new use proposals. So, Grimsby Docks, why we're all here. For those of you who aren't familiar with the geography, you see Grimsby here highlighted in red in the northeast of England. And for your orientation, Sheffield there in the centre and then Manchester and Liverpool off to the west. 
And the docks themselves um, are at the mouth of the Humber estuary, so direct access to the North Sea there to the north. And I've included this slide to really show you um, that the docks themselves are quite separated, as you can see here, from the um, centre of from Grimsby Town itself, which is down to the bottom left hand side of your screen. And then the wonderful Grimsby Dock Tower that we'll touch on in a moment at the very north on that um, peninsula. And the buildings that we're talking about today are um, this triangle in this, the top centre of your screen, a very a small handful of streets um, known locally as the Casbah. Now, um, in terms of the history of the docks, it's um, important to kind of put the Grim Grimsby as a fishing port in context. To give you some kind of um, scale of this, in 1800 only about a thousand people lived in Grimsby, but by the 1950s its population was close to 100,000. And in the late 19th and 20th centuries the town was the, fit, was the busiest fishing port in the world. It served hundreds of trawlers which fished the North Sea up to the North Pole, and it the docks really thrived as a, as a centre for storage and processing and distributing the catch. In 1938, for example, the, do the docks brought in 500 tonnes of fish a day, which could be directly transported to London by rail. Um, and um, obviously then after the 1950s, the England's fishing industry went into, was in decline and this trajectory continued for many decades. Um, and the the Casbar complex, which you can see here in this slide, which is a slightly more zoomed image of the one before, um, became increasingly redundant through the later 20th century and early 2000s. And although there, there are still a small number of businesses in, based in the Casbar, the majority of the buildings are vacant and some have been in a very bad state of repair for, for some years. But this slide is great because it really shows you how densely packed in all these buildings are into this very small, really handful of streets which make up um, the Casbah, situated in, this, in a much wider dock complex area. And um, the, the, the fact that we still have these remaining buildings really is a testament to the um, unique historic environment. Historic England, which is the government's um, advisors on heritage describe the Casbah as the most important representation of industrial scale fishing trade in England. And within just this triangle of streets, you have eight different listed buildings um, and which and list, listed buildings in England mean that they are buildings which are nationally identified as important for either historic or architectural reasons. So um, and, and that offers them a degree of protection from demolition. So really and for such a small area there is so much intense history and interest it really is a is a fascinating place um and i've included some um pictures here just to give you a feel of of the place um, and on the left hand side we have the listed tom taylor and son shop which um still sells lots of um marine wares and that is a grade two listed building in its own right and then of course you have the dock tower the Grimsby Dock Tower, which is a grade one listed tower, um, and it is um, really so significant, grade one being the highest grade of listing that you can get in England for a historic monument. It's um, really, really fantastic. Built in 1851 and modelled on the 14th century Torre del Mangia in the Palazzo Publico in Siena, known, of course, as a centre for European trade since the Middle Ages. And this tower here was central to the hydraulic system that controlled all the mechanisms of Grimsby Docks for um, a number of, for a, small, a short period of time, but um, still a really fantastic monument in, in the docks. And then here you can see, these are some streetscape pictures of um, the, the types of buildings that we're dealing with, two to three storeys, very densely, um, uh, developed, um, really making use of quite deep plots. There wasn't much need for um, sunlight and daylight, so they really made the use of all the, the plots that they could. Um, and what's really fantastic here is that you see um, a whole different range of um, building uses that were used in, in these um, buildings. You have warehouses, storage, um, you have shops for, um, and um, workshops for making nets and sails, ropes, you had smithies, you had um, engineering workshops, you had sawmills, um, you also had administration offices for the for the companies that worked there. There was all kinds of hustle and bustle and different activities going on in these buildings. 
And of course, you can't mention Grimsby without mentioning the traditional fish smokeries, which Vicky will talk about um, in a moment. But these um, are hugely important to the identity of of Grimsby and the docks. And there are six of these um, buildings are actually listed within the, the um, this area of the Casbah. So it, um, it yeah, it really is a fascinating, fascinating. Um, place which I really urge anyone who hasn't been to, to, to visit. And then lastly, we can't talk again about the Casbah without mentioning the grade two star listed ice factory. It, um, John, John Darlington is going to talk about this in a moment, but it is one of the most significant buildings in the docks. It lies just outside that the, the Casbah, but is nevertheless hugely important to the history of the area. And um, I think, John, this is a good moment to pass on to you when we're talking about the ice factory. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Henrietta. Uh, and if I can have fantastic, the slide is there. So uh, firstly, it's great to be here. Uh, secondly, it's really good to see Henrietta again, because uh, Henrietta and Save Britain's Heritage share exactly the same office on exactly the same floor as World Monuments Fund in Britain. Uh, and normally we can wave across at each other various ca filing cabinets. So it's really good to see her again. <coughs> uh, coronavirus has meant that everyone's now working from home. Uh, and I should say at this stage to, to avoid any sense of confusion, uh, I'm not actually on a Grimsby trawler. Uh, my home is, is a barge on the Thames in London. Uh, and talking about offices, World Monuments Fund is a affiliate of World Monuments Fund uh, which is based out of World Monuments Fund Britain, is an affiliate of World Monuments Fund in New York, whose offices are on the 24th floor of the Empire State Building, which you can see on that slide uh, on the right hand side. Uh, we were established in 1965 by Colonel James Gray, who had a, a, a passion for heritage and for, uh, for heritage globally. And he was looking for an organisation to support heritage and its preservation across the world he couldn't find one so he effectively established one himself and that eventually became world monuments fund and then since 1965 next slide please henrietta uh, we have been involved in something like 100 different countries on uh, about 800 different initiatives in those countries and they range from the kind of global superstars, which you can see in front of you. So the, the Qilong Gardens in the Forbidden City in Beijing in China, through to uh, the uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where we've had a, a long involvement in training uh, and preservation at that particular place, through to places like Machu Picchu in Peru. So we, we get involved in those global superstars, but we also, and this is really important, we also get involved in sites which might not be World Heritage sites, but they've got a story to tell, which is important across the whole world. And our main campaigning tool is something called the World Monuments Watch. Next slide, please. And the World Monuments Watch happens every two years. And essentially, uh, we select a small number of sites across the world which address a number of issues which heritage and people are facing. So those issues might be war or climate change or natural disaster uh, or, or mass tourism. Those are the kinds of things that we're interested in helping provide solutions for. Uh, and in order to get on the watch, the site has to be internationally significant or has a story which has resonance across the world. It has to have uh, some kind of threat, uh, which is, uh, over it uh, and it has to have a really sound community group and community interest in the site because we don't do anything without partnership and we, we, we own nothing everything's reliant upon local people the 2020 watch which was has come out this year uh, includes sites such as uh, Notre Dame in Paris of course which suffered from the fire last year uh, there's the Mam Rashan Shrine, which is a Yazidi temple which was destroyed uh, by uh, ISIS in northwest Iraq. And we're helping the Yazidi community to reconstruct that as a, as a, a symbol of their, their faith and, and, and uh, renewal. 
And on the right hand side, you can see an image of Bears Ears National Park in the United States, which is threatened by changing legislation, which potentially allows for more development to take place, which will undermine its heritage value. In the UK, next slide please, uh, for 2020, uh, we have selected the Benali Viaduct, which is a, uh, a kind of a, a beautiful structure which spans uh, across the River Airwash in between Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. So a lovely, amazing Victorian structure made out of wrought iron, the longest surviving one in the UK. And there we're working with the friends of Benali Viaduct and the owners to to bring that back into life it it was uh, made redundant during the, the the cuts of the 1960s 1970s uh, and that project is actually happening right now there's about 1.2 million pounds worth of investment going to reopen the viaduct and to create a cycling network to create to create a walking path and connecting up various different communities so that's the watch in 2020 uh, but if we rolled back now to uh, to, to uh, 2014. Uh, next slide, please. That was when the, uh, the, the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust approached us to say, would we consider putting the ice factory on the watch? And so we looked at our criteria and it's a very rigorous criteria. We've got uh, an external panel of experts. We have you know, huge competition, competition to get on the watch. But we looked at the criteria and it hit all those criteria sort of dead on. So is it internationally significant? Is it important heritage? Well, yes, it is. Uh, it was constructed in the early years of 1900. Uh, and as, the, as Grimsby grew, as, as uh, Henrietta said, to become the busiest uh, fishing port in the world, so too the services to service that industry also grew. So this ice, fa that ice factory, uh, eventually ended up as being the biggest ice factory in the entire world uh, and at one stage was able to produce 1,200 tonnes of ice every single day and that's obviously to, to serve the fishing industry uh, and transport on. So yes it's hugely significant. Next slide please. And significant not only externally but also internally because when you look inside this building it's still filled with the machinery uh, and the accoutrements of the ice manufacturing business. So you've got great big ammonia compressors dating from various different periods. So it's a grade two star building, very important in its own right. But these pictures also, next slide please, they also illustrate uh, one of the issues which, or the, the big issue which the ice factory and indeed the wider Casbah faced. And that is, the best way to describe it is, of course, the, the, the threat of the fishing industry effectively disappearing. Uh, the, the statistics I, I like to use are that in 1948, there were 462 registered trawlers working out of Grimsby docks. And that included something like 24,000 people directly involved in the fishing industry. So, but if you fast forward to 2013, there were just five registered trawlers. So 462 down to five. So you can see the issue uh, that the whole industry collapses. These buildings need to find a new use. So that's our second box. Does it tick? Uh, is it nationally important? Yes. Is it threatened? Absolutely. It needs to find a new use. And the, 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 the third uh, slide, the third piece of our jigsaw. Uh, next slide, please, Henrietta is does it have a local group who can champion it? And with the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust, yes, it does. A, a group who have, have professionalism, who really know the site and who are prepared to get out there and campaign with us and with our support uh, to really put the spotlight on this place. So it made the 2014 watch list and we've we, we put the spotlight on it. We've encouraged people to support it. Uh, I think the story moves on now to 2016 when uh, not the ice factory but some of the major buildings in the Casbah area were uh, threatened with demolition and at that stage we were alerted to this by the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust and we by turn talked to SAVE in the same office obviously and said what can we do about this and so World Monuments Fund supported a legal challenge 
to uh, the demolition of those Casbar buildings. And this is the point when I hand the story back to Henrietta. Henrietta. Thank you very much, John. Yes, so here we are back in 2016. And the buildings in question are these ones which I've highlighted in red. You can see they uh, it makes up the whole of one side of um, a principal street in the Casbah called um, Fishdock Road. Um, they, it was a collection of six different buildings, a variety of warehouses, stores um, and commercial premises. And the key here was that they were not listed of any grade and nor were they in a conservation area. So they had they didn't benefit from any type of statutory protection. The um, owners, the Associated British Ports, had submitted an application to demolish these buildings. And um, we objected strongly due to the historic significance of all of um, the buildings in the Casmar, but in particular these buildings, um, because of their prominence. And also they face some listed buildings in, in the street opposite. So we really felt that the, their context, as well as the individual buildings themselves, were of um, of local and really national importance. Um, and here you can see these, these buildings in close up. Um, they're known, known as the coastal buildings and um, yes, really, really fine um, turn of the century architecture that I, I think are very evocative of, of that time and tell such an important story about people as well as, as, well as the, all the activities in the fishing industry that, that once thrived there. Um, these pictures are taken for us by Barry and Genesis Evely, who um, very kindly volunteered their services for these photographs. And, and I really think they, they are really fantastic. So the campaign um, drew a lot of attention nationally as well as locally. We had articles you can see here in the in private eye in nooks and corners and also in the Guardian newspaper. Um, it featured heavily on social media. And we also had a letter published in The Times um, where we appealed to the owners associated with British Ports and also to North East Lincolnshire Council to halt the planned demolition. Um, we argued that um, their representation, their unique representation of of this moment in in British history was was too valuable to be thrown away and that there could be a viable future um, for the town by reusing these buildings. The letter was signed by the World Monuments Fund, as well as the Victorian Society, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, the Ancient Monuments Society, the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust and the traditional, the Grimsby traditional fish smokers group. So it was a real variety of different um, organisations. We also had strong support from Historic England and um, the Prince's Regeneration Trust. Um, so although so so although the council um, decided to grant permission for the demolition of these buildings, we we um, launched a legal bid, and that was very much thanks to support from um, the World Monuments Fund. We went to the High Court in London and we argued that because of the, the, the immense and obvious historical significance of this area, that these buildings should at least have to go through a, a proper planning application process because they were actually being fast tracked through a what's known as prior approval planning system. So, um, but unfortunately, the judge in the High Court did not agree with our case and we lost. That meant that that whole row of buildings was actually demolished at um, the end of 2016. We um, were obviously, this, it was obviously uh, a sad, a sad moment for us and all the organisations and people who had um, helped with the campaign. But it did also shine a particular spotlight on the Casbah and the heritage of these buildings. And, um, and I'm really pleased that we took that action because it really was a call to arms in a way and, and a really important, a really important thing to do. Um, this is a good moment, I think, to bring in Vicky, um, who will bring us up to date with what's happened in the Casbah since. Vicky, over to you. Hi, Henrietta. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's good to be doing an event with you and John. Um, yes, well, actually, I, I'll say I, I have nothing but good news to report. <laughs> Uh, which will cheer people up, I'm sure. Um, a, a word about the Great Grimsby Ice Factory Trust. We were founded um, exactly 10 years ago. We're a building preservation trust and we started out because we wanted to find a new sustainable use for the Grimsby Ice Factory because it was such an important building to Grimsby. There were just four trustees to begin with, all of us from Grimsby. Um, 
And then we weren't really quite sure what to do, having formed the trust. So we started contacting uh, heritage organisations and SAVE was among them. Uh, SAVE came to Grimsby and had a look at the Casbah and look at, looked at the ice factory and took us on a very interesting field trip to Ipswich to meet uh, people who had uh, regenerated the docks there. We gradually came to understand how significant our heritage was. We hadn't really understood that before. It wasn't just important to us locally, but it was important nationally and internationally. And when the ice factory in Casbah appeared on the World Monuments Fund's 2014 list, um, it was just a really strong shift in perspective for local people to see Grimsby up there next to Venice, which is just wild, really. Um, yes, so here are some of the little buildings in the Casbah. There are about 90 buildings left, and almost all of them are different from each other. Uh, this is because people would take a, a, a small plot and build whatever it was, they whatever they could afford and whatever they needed to carry out their business. And as Henrietta said, they, that could be sail making or basket weaving. There were several banks, a post office. So essentially, what we would now call the supply chain to the fishing industry was accommodated in the Casbah. Um, people locally always called the Casbah a town within a town because there was, as Henrietta said, there was so much going on there. Um, but it's, uh, it's still the most important collection of industrial fishing buildings in the UK. Um, for some years, the uh, local government and the landowners and Historic England had been having a discussion about this little area and how to best preserve it. And in October 2017, the Casbah was designated a conservation area. We'll go to the next slide if you could. Thank you. Here's some more of these quirky little buildings. There's Tom Taylor's again, because it's so beautiful. Um, a great thing about being a conservation area is that it opens up funding opportunities to help mm. regenerate the buildings. Um, Historic England has uh, partnered with the local government and the landowners to create a fund to help people who want to take on a building and they can get up to 70% grants for renovation. Um, conservation area status has also given other funders um, the confidence to invest in projects. So uh, their investment, they feel as though their investment is protected by this conservation area status. Uh, the next thing that happened was that the Casbah Steering Group was formed in 2018 and uh, members of this group are representatives from the landowners, from local government, from Historic England and from the Ice Factory Trust. And uh, we all work together to try to make happen our joint vision for the Casbah, which focuses on three main areas. And if we go to the next slide, I can tell you about um, artisanal food production. Traditional Grimsby smoked fish is a real thing. It's a very high quality specialty product um, that was awarded protected geographical status by the EU. So you can't pretend to have made Grimsby traditional smoked fish anywhere else but in Grimsby. And you have to have made it um, in a certain way in a traditional smokehouse. And uh, I think Henrietta mentioned that there are, there's, uh, Grimsby has uh, the largest cluster of smokehouses in the UK, but not all of them are fit for, for work. Um, the fish is cold smoked in, in these smokehouses in the chimneys and uh, the unique weather conditions on the Humber really um, contribute to um, to the skills and the um, process. Um, in these photos, as you can see at the bottom right, the men are filleting the fish and at the top right, they're loading the, the hanging the fillets on these metal speaks, which are then, as you can see in the main picture, loaded into the chimney and they're left overnight with uh, sawdust smouldering at the bottom of the chimney. And then they're taken out in the morning and they're ready, to, ready to go. Um, next slide, please. So another, we, we lost the fishing industry 
But within the last 10 years, the Humber region has seen the advent of the renewables industry. So um, that's been a, a great um, economic boost to the area, providing skilled jobs and um, investment. And Grimsby has become the operations and maintenance headquarters for the North Sea wind farms. Um, some of these international companies like Ersted and Catapult have built um, big office places on the docks in Grimsby um, and they're quite close to the Casbah. So the Victorian buildings in the conservation area will be ideal for conversion back into office spaces and facilities for mm. supply chain to the renewables industry. Um, next slide, please. So unsurprisingly, when you have an area with quirky old buildings, not in a you know, terrifically good state, um, the creative industries get interested because they think they can have workshops and uh, premises that are really cool. And uh, since the Casbah was made a conservation area, there's been a lot of interest from the creative industries. Uh, as you can see, uh, one of our local ar architects has taken a building and uh, oh, at the bottom right, you can see um, a couple of guys from Creative Start, Sam Delaney on the left and one of his colleagues. They are um, a community interest company that works with vulnerable adults and they're responsible for quite a bit of really good, interesting public art around the town. This, this piece that they've done on their wall um, recently, their latest work, um, is a transcription of an old um, advertisement for ice um, from the great from the Great Grimsby Ice Company. But this ice wasn't manufactured in an ice factory. It was harvested in Norway, put onto boats, brought to Grimsby, unloaded, put on trains, and taken anywhere in the country. It's extraordinary that you know ice was quite a business in Grimsby even before the technology developed to um, make. Uh, big factory. Um, so Creative Start moved into their own building last year in 2019 and the Arts Council has um, subsequently awarded uh, a, a lot of money to uh, fund the conversion of another six buildings um, and make them into Creative Industries workspace. So uh, we're going to have three main areas of uh, development, uh, we hope, and uh, the Ice Factory Trust recently got funding to develop a website which is going to kind of bring everything together, all this, uh, you know, the di all the di diverse elements of uh, the Casbah community, the new Casbah community. So, um, Henrietta kindly did a map for me to show you where um, where these two buildings are that I'm just about to tell you about. This is our, our project at the moment is the Petersons project and we are work, going to be working on two buildings, um, the Petersons Smokehouse on Henderson Street and Building 89, otherwise known as Fred's Fish, on Warncliffe Road. The back of Building 89 actually connects through to um, Petersons on Henderson Street, which is quite nice. Um, th this project has been brought forward by the Ice Factory Trust, but in partnership with the landowners and with local government. So um, it, it, there's quite a nice story about how this partnership came about. Um, Prince Charles's birthday was approaching and the Princess Regeneration Trust, who had been supporting our organisation for a long time, decided to celebrate um, his birthday by funding seven heritage projects and they invited us to make a two million pound proposal. Um, this was all before the conservation area was designated or anything like that. We didn't actually have um, a project ready to go. So we called um, the conservation officer who worked for the local government and she invited um, some people from ABP, the landowners, and we all sat around a table and we worked up this project. Uh, we only had three weeks to do it but we worked really hard and it was honestly, it was really quite exciting. We didn't unfortunately make the final cut. We didn't get the two million pounds, but 
it had been such a good experience, such a positive and productive process that we decided we would continue and uh, try to fund the project another way. So three years later, just last month, um, we've been awarded almost a million pounds by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the Architectural Heritage Fund to deliver the first phase of the project, which is these two buildings. So the first building is um, Peterson Smokehouse. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are there's quite a big cluster of smokehouses, but not all of them, you know, are in working condition. And as, as you can see from the the top photograph there, um, it's uh, the smoke. This uh, Peterson's is not in very good nick. Um, the bottom photograph shows the some of the cowls from the chimneys, which were um, taken off and saved, which is very nice. Um, and then the left hand picture is um, a visualization by fleet architects of what the building will look like when it's finished and they've given us a shop and everything. What we're going to do is uh, completely renovate the building and then rent it out to um, a business, a smoking business. Next slide, please. So um, I think you you might notice you've seen this earlier. The building in the middle with the blue um, bay windows is building 89, otherwise known as Fred's Fish. Um, and that will be returned to use with um, offices on the upper two floors, which it was before. You can see um, in, in that top photograph how, um, you know, the, the, part, the old partitioning. Um, <clears throat> and the bottom, the ground floor, we will make into um, a public space, a, a cafe and a meeting area, um, which is um, the kind of use that is sadly lacking in this part. Um, both of these buildings, as I said, will be um, rented out on a commercial basis and the income will come to the Ice Factory Trust, but we have made a commitment that that income will be ploughed back into um, new projects within the CASBAR. So we are in kind of a rolling building preservation trust. We're not just fixed on one building. Um, next slide, please. So back to the ice factory. Um, until a new, new use can be found for it, we are just trying to just keep an eye on the building. Uh, last year, we commissioned an updated condition survey and this year, Historic England is funding a specialised report on the roof structure um, and, and um, then we'll, we'll have options um, to consider, which will tell us, you know, allow us to um, make the building watertight. Um, still, within the last two or three years, there's been quite a bit of interest from investors and a number of ideas have been floated, including, as you can see, a 1400 seat um, capacity regional theatre. Um, the, the building is actually currently being marketed for sale and um, I suppose you could find that on the internet. Um, <clears throat> so there's no doubt that all the excitement and interest around the Casbah has really supported um, and, and contributed to confidence in the potential for reutilising the ice factory itself. Um, and I would just end by saying that thankfully the conversation has now shifted from talk of whether or not the building should be demolished to what would be the best use for the building within Grimsby's broader plans for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vicky. That's a terrific overview and so interesting to see the individual projects um, that are being um, brought forward in the Casbah. Really, really fascinating. John, I know you wanted to kick off the questions um, with a question for Vicky about the ice factory. Yes, indeed. So, so Vicky, uh, the Grimsby Ice Factory Trust has been going for 10 years now, which is mm -hmm. a good yeah. time. And I, I, I wondered really how the attitude towards the ice factory and the Casbah had changed, particularly from the perspective of the local authority and the owners in that 10 year period. Well, I, it's changed enormously. I, I have to say where the Casbah now feeds into the wider investment plans for the town and 
Also, the ice factory and the Casbah are now um, at one end of a heritage action zone, which um, starts on Grimsby Docks, follows the waterways through the town and ends up um, in the older part of the town uh, with the medieval minster. And that um, has really um, brought things together with um, a strong recognition of the value of the heritage. And uh, the, we have a heritage action zone officer who's in charge of taking care of um, the heritage within this zone, but with a particular um, concern to um, oversee the projects in the Casbah and bring the, re the uh, regeneration of the Casbah forward. Um, so it couldn't be better, really. That's fantastic. So um, we've got some questions in the box. The first question here um, is why is it called the Casbah? That's probably a good question for you, Vicky. Mm, well, um, somebody must have called it the Casbah at some point <laughs> and then it caught on. Um, I, I heard it being called the Casbah by my partner who worked on the docks all his life and starting in the 1960s so I think it was probably called the Casbah back then. Um, I do I, I do think that there was um, a particular little area actually behind um, Peterson's that um, was particularly built up with little runways um, in between the buildings and that may have been uh, where it started, but those buildings have actually gone now, I'm afraid. Right, okay, so that's probably where the, the origin of the name came from. I think so, I think yeah. so, but the way, it's called the Casbah now. <laughs> well, it's a brilliant name, I think. Um, and we've got another question here, how important has the local community been in the campaign to save the site? Has public opinion changed? Is that for me too? Yeah, I think that's a good well, one. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Ten years ago, uh, just going by uh, what happened in public meetings, I would say that about 50% of people in the town really supported the heritage and wanted to preserve it. And about 50% thought that it was a bit of a, um, an albatross around our necks and it was probably better to move on. I would hope after after this 10 years and after having been on the World Monuments Watch and um, also thanks to SAVE being um, recognised by Europa Nostra and everything that we've learned about our heritage over the last 10 years and how important it is, I would hope that a significant number of that other 50% have probably begun to regard um, mm. our local heritage as an asset now. Yeah, right. Um, and there's a, another question here um, from Lisa Briggs. It's, she says, it seems that there's been a very collaborative effort. Can you tell us a bit more about the collaboration between the local community and the national entities like SAVE and the World Monuments Fund? Well, um, yes, I mean, from, from our point of view, uh, reaching out to as many national um, and local organisations was hugely important in terms of generating interest and support for the campaign. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I can't stress enough how important it was to to work with um, all these organisations. And of course, with um, World Monuments Fund, we wouldn't have been able to do it, John, without your financial support for the, the legal action. So, I mean, it was brilliant to be able to work with you directly like that. Um, and no, course, I, think, yes. I think from our perspective, that coming back to how we and other organisations like us work, that the importance of having uh, someone who can be an advocate nationally and internationally is fantastic but that means nothing unless it's rooted in the community and a strong community voice so so we don't work with anyone who doesn't have that strong community advocate and voice that's part of our dna so you know this was a perfect project for us to get involved in because there was that that strong uh, local voice in this right yeah um, and, and the local voice, Vicky, also being you fundamentally, I think having your insights as, as, as an organisation based in Grimsby was obviously critical. Um, and someone else here has said, do you think the project would have been as successful or even feasible if you didn't have the support or input of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, the Georgian Group, the Victorian Society, etc. Um, and, and more recently, the 
um, fund, uh, funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. I think that um, during the campaign, being able to call on national organisations um, like the other amenity societies was really great from a heritage point of view. Um, and it made it, it was um, really reassuring that when needed in really in kind of SOS situations, um, these organisations ca can come together and and, um, and speak in unison. Um, I do think it helped with the with the publicity and there are, are of course lot, countless other sites and buildings around the country that don't necessarily have that benefit of all these different organizations supporting them but um all i would say to that is that the, the sooner we hear about these cases the more we can garner support and draw in others um and um so yeah it's it's really important and it's really helpful <laughs> i don't know if you want to add anything to that vicky but um in terms of the local angle of having support from national organizations um I think um, I think what we we learned so much about who all who you all were, you know, in a in a fairly um, short space of time, and uh, it you you were still a mystery to a lot of a lot of the people, maybe maybe local government and so on here, and uh, it was kind of our role to introduce you all to them yeah. and uh, it you know it was a process it took it took time for for, uh, for for us locally to absorb the fact that that there were these connections to these other organizations and uh, that um that people that other people cared about our heritage yeah. just as much if not more than we did um, there's a, so, there's a didn't quite answer the question. I'm sorry. No, no, did. that's no, that's great. Um, there's a and there's a good question here, John, for you. Did the Grade Two Star listing of the ice factory include the original ice making equipment? And um, this, uh, Miriam says, we found in Brunel's train sheds in Swindon that some of the listings called for the conservation of the interior fixtures as well as the building, which seemed really important. Um, but the retention of the interior machinery can sometimes limit the reuse which is um, okay. important, especially the, the magnitude of that that uh, machinery in the ice factories. Is yes, indeed. So, so obviously listing does and can include the, the, uh, in the machinery on the interior of the building. So yes, is the answer. And also, yes, that does, uh, that can limit what you can then put the, the ice factory, uh, what use you can put the ice factory to. But it's all about a process of negotiation, what's right, what fits, uh, the future of this building. The most important thing from our perspective and indeed from, from uh, other people's perspective is that we find a way to put this building back into a use which is valued and which is relevant today, but which retains the spirit of uh, the spirit of the place. That's the key thing. Right. Thank you. And could, actually, could I, could I also say that it's a gigantic building and there is some massive machinery in there, but there are also some um, quite, um, there's quite a bit of available open space. Hmm. So no, it's not, it's not as much of a challenge as you might think. Lots to play for. Um, and there's mm -hmm. a really, <laughs> indeed, and there's a, there's a um, good question here. Can you describe what it, you think it will be wa like walking down Warcliffe, Warncliffe Road? in 10 years time from now, Vicky, Ooh. what's your vision? Well, hopefully, um, you know, you'll, you'll be um, popping in and out of um, wonderful artisanal food shops and cafes and um, you'll, um, there'll be a bustle of people going to and from their offices and uh, it'll be all smart and beautiful, yeah. <laughs> and bustling once again. Well, I think yes, um, this is a good time to wrap up. We've gone slightly over time, but um, we've had some brilliant questions and thank you so much for all your comments and hellos from all over the world and um, every, all your contributions. Thank you all very much. And a huge thank you to John and to Vicky for joining us today to, to reflect on the battle to save Grimsby's historic docks. We are putting our um, website details in the chat box so you can find out more about our organisations 
online. And if you do have any direct questions you'd like to ask us about any of the, the things we've talked about today, do please um, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, yes, thank you once again for tuning in and um, hope to see you again at another event soon. Goodbye. Bye.